I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, I like, this is just, this is, this is how David Mitchell makes me feel. Hi, hello, my name's Ollie Bliss and this is my channel Book Draw. For those who don't know, I enjoy looking at queer fiction and occasionally I create images about it, but today I'm doing a wrap up. I feel like I was probably comatose throughout February and like March was just kind of waking up a little bit. But I have uh, had quite a productive little reading month this month. I'm, I'm very pleased with myself and that's because it's been incredibly easy. Uh, having done predominantly mainly listening to what I should probably go through some of the books I read. Starting with A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Now this is a big shout out to Michael over in Catalyst Reads. I hope you're doing really well and that you do get a chance to um, reread A Brave New World. At the start of the book <laughs> um, you, there is a scientist who is taking a bunch of um, students uh, around the factory and they explain how um, people are now produced instead of like being biologically made and that's actually something which is quite taboo and a bit disgusting um, you you don't reproduce a child through having sex you just chemically make them you inseminate an egg and they can churn out like over 90 odd identical twins or something um, and they have uh, conditioning um, into them at an early age uh, and there's a hierarchy in terms of um, each uh, level of the, the kids are given um, ideas about how they should be living their life and they are discouraged so they're actually like conditioned and electrified as kids uh, from sniffing f flowers and reading books so that they are deterred from those things and uh, instead they are uh, fed and told about the things that they should want and but also knowing their place in the hierarchy so you have like deltas who are kind of the minions who go around doing other things and they they should be happy that they are do providing this function um, and you have alphas who shouldn't want to associate themselves with the deltas and they should be um, happy because um, they are uh, out in the world achieving and you've got the ones in between and um, they don't want to be working as hard as they are first, so they, sh they shouldn't um, distract themselves with them or try to be like them, but also they should know that they're better than Deltas. No, I'm sure any Delta is much brighter than Epsilons like those. That's one of the wonderful things about being a Gamma. We're not too stupid and we're not too bright. To be a Gamma is to be just right. So it's interesting in terms of how, like, structure social structure is enforced and conditioned at an early age. You could say we do that as people already in our society, and it, but it's just done in a more direct uh, way and it's not through media it's, um, it, or, it, or parenting, it's actually through um, direct conditioning by scientists in a factory. Like inst instead of wholesome values, the traditional Christian values that have been stripped away and taken away, we no longer have a God um, that doesn't exist, there's no purpose for that anymore, um, just doesn't provide a function and people aren't afraid to die and they don't age anymore, so there's no need for that. Instead, if people need new things and they shouldn't uh, hold on to these old concepts, um, and they should instead be focusing on becoming happy to the point of even giving up your freedom to be unhappy in order to be compliant and complacent and comatose and they take this thing called soma which is basically like a sleeping coma pill which, um, which induces this pleasurable sensation um, like an opiate. It's like, I mean, I got the sense this is proper like sociological concept and it's like the hypodermic syringe for society and keeping you docile and keeping you in your place. And yeah, I just, I thought it was really dark, <laughs> but really, really good, really brilliant for something that was um, done in 1930. His justifications for the way in which the society and structure is set is terrifying and brilliant and it's so cynical and bleak. So High Rise by um, J.G. Ballard which is a beautiful film and, and that's why I ended up reading it because um, I just massively loved the movie. It's set in a kind of future 1970s vibe. The cinematography of it is just stunning. It's full of lots of beautiful attractive actors and actresses 
and they just walk around being cool. <laughs> the book itself is really interesting because it's basically looking at social structure in a high-rise. Um, so it's luxury apartments, but you don't actually have like a working class, they're kind of not discussed in the book, but instead you have, it's kind of three sections, and the, the lower section are predominantly with families. So they're rich enough to be there, but they're not rich enough to just enjoy the freedom of having surplus income because they're spending it on their kids. And you've got this middle ground where there's lots of like people who are kind of somewhere in between um, and they've got dogs and um, fr are more frivolous with their cash. And then you've got like the super elite who are kind of at the top level. The high rise structure um, provides everything. All, all your needs in in this one building, so you never have to leave. This sense of isolation and captivity is just amplified so much more in this building because they walk past each other, they see each other, um, but there's also this weird kind of tribal um, society going on because it's removed from authority. Like, they know that the police exist out there but they they don't really discuss any sort of authoritarian figures which exist inside the high rise so they all have access to the police if they wanted to but there's almost this internal code of conduct where they don't need it and they actually prefer living the the way that that they are but things begin to incrementally go wrong. And because they're living in this little bubble, no one's really going out and no one's going out of their way to make any changes to what's going on internally because they think it's someone else's responsibility. So this, the, and this idea continues that they don't really need to be accountable for anything and it gets more and more um, prevalent once a dog dies mysteriously in a swimming pool and also a person dies and um, uh, from falling from the high rise and <laughs> hits one of the cars outside the front and nobody tells the police or bothers to call because they all think somebody else is going to do it so like there's just this person's body and you don't really know what happens to the body either um, but all the cars that are at the front uh, are from the really wealthy because they basically get to drive straight in up to the front door and then go straight to the top of, of the high rise um, There, all their cars are getting trashed but they're so wealthy that they don't even need to care about their own cars <laughs> the structure begins to erode and implode in on itself to the point where they're eating the dogs and um, they're creating barricades outside of each other's rooms and they're raiding each other. It's just brilliant. And then in terms of something completely different and fantastical, I also read A Gentleman's Guide um, to Vice and Virtue by Mackenzie Lee. A big shout out to Christopher Gelanti, who I know has recently read this as well. Um, I hope you really enjoyed it too. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, it's a book which I know a lot of people have already read, and that's probably why I've gotten onto the train and just decided to uh, go along with it all. But it's just cool. It's just a cool story. It's a story featuring Henry Monty Montague and his best friend Percy, who he's like secretly in love with, and his younger annoying bookworm of a sister, Felicity. And they're doing a last hurrah in terms of their going off and doing what's like, was known as a tour in the 1700s, where they're gonna sail around Europe and have their last adventure together before they all go off on their separate ways. Um, but, a series of random stuff happens to them which makes them go on a, a very different adventure to what they were expecting. Monty is a privileged, irritating, careless, frivolous young buck who is in love with um, Percy, his best friend and confidant. Their romance is just really endearing and it just makes you kind of shine because 
you can see that Monty, uh, his, his character is bisexual, so he's quite frivolous with both men and women, the way he kind of treats them as another kind of material thing, entity, like, he's, he just, he consumes, he's just constantly consuming, he's a drunk, he's a player, like, he just, he doesn't care, he doesn't have to care, he's incredibly privileged, that he just doesn't have to consider other people, but he does consider Percy. Um, and he, it, throughout the book, is forced to consider Percy more and more. And the dynamic between them, because he just sees Percy for who he is, as a wonderful best friend, because Percy has dual heritage, is often confronted with racism. What I really enjoyed about the way um, Mackenzie Lee handles racism and handles um, uh, treatment of women and disability in this era, she just kind of peppers it in, in terms of just saying, People should be kind of aware of these things and how these things work, but it's not like a really core part of the story. It's just like, yeah, this was going on, but this is a voice of a young, privileged, bisexual guy at this time and how he is even reacting to these situations. And I thought it was quite cool for, for playing with that. And it, because it is fun, it, it, the whole book is just a, a real, just, adventure and it's really light-hearted um, but <laughs> Felicity who is clearly the most competent being between the three of them I thought she would just kind of be a bit of a periphery character um, and it would just all be about those two but she was amazing and it like I loved Felicity I loved everything about her she's training to be, um, become a doctor secretly she's constantly helping the other two get out of some ridiculous situations and um, she's really insightful and she's very direct and uh, but she's also quite devious in the same way that Monty is but she uses her kind of devious manipulative Machiavellian behaviour for the greater good. Like the only criticism uh, I had of the book is that they're, they're doing this tour and because Monty is, he's like this massive drunk player boy, he just, he's, he's frivolous and he doesn't care about his surroundings at all. Um, and so in a lot of ways there's zero descriptions of the places that he goes to. And they are beautiful, spectacular places. And the kind of heritage and the history of those places, for me, didn't come through in the book. And I thought just a bit more nuance or a bit more of a reference to sense of place would have lifted the book a little bit more for me. But I get that this is more of a pacey YA book. But I just thought it was a really missed opportunity in terms of there was so much beauty. It's a bit of a disappointment because I came into the book expecting a, a quite a, like a visual feast going from place to place on this epic journey. It was an epic journey. Where they were going wasn't really the key focus of it. It was about what was happening while they were on that journey. And the last book I read was The Bone Clocks, which is by David Mitchell. And I really, really, really love uh, David Mitchell's A Cloud Atlas. So I had high expectations for this book. Um, and it didn't disappoint, but it wasn't as good, I'd say, as Cloud Atlas. So the book starts off in 1984 and it goes through, I think it was like five or six different time periods up to 2043. But it all the characters, it's done from different people's perspectives in the similar way that Cloud Atlas is, but they're all tied into the central character, Holly Sykes. So it's her when she's growing up, she's then an adult and then she's like a grandmother later on. So you're seeing her different periods of her life. And it's an adventure through time. Um, and what I find really interesting about David Mitchell's style is his overarching themes about life. The Bone Clocks and Cloud At uh, Atlas have this sense of some greater agenda, I would say. like. The way in which Cloud Atlas, they, the people, the way they interact with each other creates these outcomes which influences things further on down the line. That is 
happening in a similar way to this, and some of the characters you could draw direct parallels from, and there is even actual parallels in the books, because they reference the Spyglass magazine, which Felix Finch it mentions in Cloud Atlas. Right there. Ah, oh, you mean Mr. Finch? Finch. Mr. Huggins should apologize to the trees found for the making of his bloated autobiographical novel. 400 made glorious pages expire in an ending that is flat and inane beyond belief. Steady down, <laughs> Now that's an ending that is flat and inane beyond belief. That magazine appears in this book so there is this kind of crossover the story was really interesting it was really fun um like it is a slower burn that um, because it's quite a big chunky book to go through um and there were times when i was like why am i even reading this i don't even know why that why this is even worth discussing <laughs> it's not really a lot happening here i mean there is this mystery about what has happened to her younger brother and you want him to be safe throughout the book um, but it's so wrapped up in this wider mystery that doesn't make sense at all and every time you think you get, you're getting closer to understanding what the hell is going on he sweeps the rug from under you and you're suddenly a new character and you've got a new voice and it's a, a different time period and you're like okay what is going on? And it doesn't seem to make any sense until you get up to the way, all the way through to the end, and you're kind of like, why did I even, what, why did I go on this journey, and what has just happened? <laughs> <laughs> what is the meaning to this? This is just, this is, this is how David Mitchell makes me feel afterwards, but I really enjoy it as well, ultimately. I <laughs> By the end of the book, I kind of felt like, yeah, that was that was fun and really rewarding, but why? I, d I don't know. I felt like by the end of the book, I just felt like that was good. But kind of pointless. <laughs> like it basically, it feels like a companion piece or an instruction manual to some convoluted mission that's going on in the universe, or in our world, and like, yeah, you're just never gonna know. And it's, he's only actually written it for a handful of people who need to know that, that information at one particular time. And there's gonna be a passage in his book which is gonna make the difference between life and death for them. My brain's a little bit pickled after all of that, because I've, <laughs> I've had a very strange reading month with those. If you've read any of these books, I'd love for you to tell me which ones you've really enjoyed, um, and I will check in with you again sometime real soon. Okay, bye!